Prayer. All right, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we thank you that we can be in your house. Lord, we just pray that you would be with us as we teach your word and that we would apply your truths to our hearts. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah, I know we're getting a late start. Um, okay, this is going to be, we're going to be reading through, and again, we're starting on the book of First Thessalonians. <clears throat> And we're going to read through verse 7 on it. And then I wanted to actually read some, some introductory material from a couple of commentaries and, and talk about it a little bit. So, Pastor, could you start? And then just we'll read around for these seven verses. Sure. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father. Knowing, brothers, beloved by God, your election. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became in imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. so that you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Okay, so again, we're, we're starting in, and I, I would like to look at this. We're actually going to be reading um, information from Math, or MacArthur's Bible Commentary, the, the book introduction, and also from the um, Jameson Fawcett Brown Commentary, which we'll look at after I read this. But the first thing, I, w I wanted to read this because it actually um, says a lot about how Paul is addressing the Thessalonians. First of all, you'll notice in verse 1, it says, Paul and, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of, Thessalon of the Thessalonians. Whereas a lot of the other epistles, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ. And some he's even more um, strong in his declaration of his authority as an apostle. In this case, Paul understands, and we're going to see that in the commentary, that they understand who he is. They understand his authority, which is why he does not emphasize it. So let me let me read through this. It's it's rather an interesting thing. Um, he says the apostle Paul identified himself twice as the author of this letter. First in chapter one, verse one, and then chapter two, verse eighteen. Silvanus, which is Silas, and Timothy, um, in chapter three, verses two and six. Paul's traveling companions on the second missionary journey when the church was founded in Acts 17, 1 to 9. We'll be reading that in a minute. We're also mentioned in Paul's greeting. Though Paul was the single inspired author, most of the first person plural pronouns, we, us, our, refer to all three. However, during Timothy's visit back to Thessalonica, they refer only to Paul and Silvanus. 
Paul commonly used such editorial plural because the letters came with the full support of his companions. Paul's authorship has not been questioned until recent until recently by radical critics. The attempts to undermine Pauline authorship have failed in light of the combined weight of evidence favoring Paul as such. One, the direct assertion of Paul's authorship, chapter one, verse one, and chapter two, verse 18. Two, the letter's perfect correlation with Paul's travels we see in Acts 6, 18 and Three, the multitude of intimate details regarding the first of Paul's two letters written from the church to the church at Thessalonica is dated around AD 51. The date has been archeologically verified by an inscription in the temple of Apollos at Delphi near Corinth, which dates Gallio's service as proconsul in Archaea, A.D. 51 to 52. In a very short time frame, if you think about it, he was there as proconsul for two years, and Paul's mention um, would verify, you know, would be verified that way. Since Paul's letter to the church of Galatia was probably written A.D. 49 through 50. This was the second piece of canonical correspondence. In other words, this is the second time <clears throat> he's written a letter that's ended, in the can that's ended up in the canon of Scripture. Um, and then the, there's a gap in his introduction. He says... Paul had originally traveled 100 miles from Philippi to Amphopolis and Antolonia to Thessalonica, his secondary missionary journey. At the custom, as the custom was upon arrival, he sought the synagogues in which to teach the local Jews the gospel. On that occasion, the, he dialogued with them on the Old Testament concerning Christ's death and resurrection in order to prove that Jesus of Nazareth was truly the promised Messiah. Some Jews believed, and soon after Hellenistic proselytes and some wealthy women of the community also were converted. Acts 17.4. Mentioned among these new believers was Jason, Acts 17.5, Gaius, Acts 19.29, Aristocrus, Acts 24, and Secundus. And then we also read this in um, the Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary, and this one is quick. I, I wanted to emphasize that when we start reading this passage in Acts, we will see that it looks like Paul was there for three weeks and then he left and went to Berea. But that's because of the brevity of the passage and not the, the actual issue of things going on. And if you, again, look throughout the scriptures, and here's where other scholars and authors have a tendency to help fill in the gaps by showing where the scriptures fill the gaps. And this is one of these from the commentary. He says this. He stays at this. His stay at Thessalonica was doubtless not limited to the three weeks in which the three Sabbaths specified in Acts 17.2 for his laboring there with his hands for his support. 1 Thessalonians 2.9 and 1 Thessalonians 3.8. His receiving supplies there more than once from Philippi, Philippians 4.16, and we'll read this passage in a minute. His making many converts from the Gentiles, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, and also two oldest manuscripts read Acts 
of the devout and of the Greeks a great multitude. Acts 17.4 And his appointing ministers all imply longer residence. <clears throat> Somebody want to read Philippians 4.15 and 16? As you, know, as you yourself also know, Philippians, that at the first preach in the gospel, soon after I left Macedonia, no church fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even, the, even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So here Paul is testifying in Philippians that he had been in Thessalonica long enough to receive two gifts, and that certainly didn't happen in three weeks. I mean, it would be kind of, back then, even as, as good as transportation was in the Roman Empire, that's a little difficult to believe. It's not like Amazon where you can get two-day delivery. <laughs> um, so we see there that Paul had received gifts from the Philippians, and therefore, even though we're going to see in Acts 17, 1 through 5, which we're going to read in a moment, is that they were there longer than the three weeks Paul spent discoursing. And I think if we see how things played out in the circumstances that forced Paul to leave and end up in Berea, that this was a buildup over time of the church growing, the, the popularity of Paul was also growing. And there was a certain amount of jealousy among the Jews who did not believe. And they stirred up trouble. Uh, somebody want to read, uh, starting, um, we're reading Acts 17, 1 through 5, and just, you know, read around starting with verse 1. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there were a synagogue of the Jews. Go ahead, Wayne. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Explaining and setting before them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is that Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with the great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks, and not a few of, leading, of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous, taking along some wicked men from the marketplace and forming a mob, set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the assembly. Now remember, Luke was writing this as a, as a witness. Um, sometimes Luke was with them, sometimes he wasn't. Generally, you can tell. Uh, in this case, he says they. So this is testimony from others that were there with Paul at the time of this. And then other times he says, we went and we did this. So, but this is, um, Luke was a historian uh, and worked at getting the facts. And I think it's important for us to understand because Part of doing apologetics is also knowing, first of all, that the scriptures are a book of history. And here we see also, what was it Paul was arguing with the Jews about? What was it he was trying to get across to them? That he was the Messiah. But what was important proof of that? What's that? Well, he died for our sins. That's part of it, yes. But what was the most important proof of ultimate importance that I think is the most important truth that we need to understand? He rose from the dead, right. That's right. 
So we see that this proof, and, and we see this here where it says, explaining and setting before them. Now he's talking to the Jews here. And he's, he's doing this, which is very important to understand, from the Old Testament. He didn't just argue from his ideas. He didn't just pull this up out of his head and start talking about it. He started reasoning from the thing that the Jews trusted most, and that was the scriptures. He went to the scriptures, and he stuck with the scriptures, and he showed how the scriptures said, when the Messiah comes, and I'm almost certain, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm almost certain that that would also include one of the most important passages in the Old Testament regarding his death and resurrection, which is Isaiah 53. I mean, Isaiah 53 is a gospel message. Clear and simple. As a matter of fact, today's Jews hardly ever read it. And they try to ignore it. And they try to push it to the back of their minds. But the fact is, that truth is there. They try to rationalize by saying, well, that just meant Israel. Didn't mean a person as a Messiah. No. Isaiah 53 talked about Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. The suffering servant who died, he was bruised for our iniquity. And by his stripes we are healed. And those are some of the things that Paul was reasoning with them. Your salvation is not by following the law. Your salvation is because the Messiah came and you missed it and now you have a chance to turn from your wicked ways and turn to the Messiah who can save you from your sinful nature. That was what Paul was arguing with the Jews. That's also why they got so mad. Nobody likes to hear the hard truth. I'm a sinner and I can't do anything about it. Sorry, but even I didn't like hearing that truth. But the point is, that is a truth. That's a hard truth for us to face. But also, there is a great joyous truth in that the Messiah rose from the dead as proof that he paid that debt. He made it possible, not just for me to be forgiven, but for me to be made into a new person. And that was also part of the gospel Paul preached. It wasn't just payment for sin, but a new nature. Many of the Thessalonians believed. Mostly they were Greeks. Some were Jews. But the Jews who again stumbled were dashed to pieces on the chief cornerstone. They stirred up trouble. And this wasn't something that happened in that three weeks as, as it appears in this passage, but it's something that happened over a period of time where many people came to, to the Lord. And Paul had the opportunity to train some and appoint some as leaders before he was forced to leave. I also wanted to read from this commentary. Uh, I have here a heading called Greeting, and this is dealing with the first verse where it says, and I'm going to read again, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of Thessalonica in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be to you and peace. Again, that grace be to you and peace. That's something Paul does and and we're going to see here and again this is from the jameson fawcett brown commentary and it says this paul he does not add an apostle because in their case as in of the philippians see philemon 1 1 
His apostolic authority needs no substantiation. He writes familiarly as to faithful friends, not but that his apostleship was recognized among him, such as 1 Thessalonians 2.6. On the other hand, in writing to the Galatians, among whom some held in question, had in que- called into question his apostleship, he strongly asserts his superscription, an undersigned proprietary propriety in the epistles evincing genuineness. When he talked to the Galatians, he not just said that, but he said, called by God, appointed by God. I mean, he, a lot of me just said Paul an apostle. But with the Galatians, since they had strayed so far, he very strongly asserted, I didn't make myself an apostle. The church itself didn't make me an apostle. God himself made me an apostle. In this case, he didn't have to say that. That's one of the things that we see when when we see Paul's epistles that, you know, it's kind of interesting to see how he starts each one off. Because... How he starts them off actually has a tendency to show, is this going to be adversarial or encouraging? Some of them it wasn't just adversarial, but more or less <clears throat> like in Ephesians. He named himself an apostle, but he did not go as far as he did with the Galatians, mainly because in Ephesians, Paul was setting forth a very strong doctrinal premise for for continuing forth as Christians. Ephesians is a very smaller version of the book of Romans in terms of theology. There's a lot of deep theology there. And Paul wanted to assert his authority as an apostle. In this case, this is a letter of encouragement. This is a letter to say to the Thessalonians, I'm there for you. The Lord is there for you. And we are praying for you. And we'll see that in the next couple of verses next week. I wanted to read Philemon, verse 1. He says to Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. Notice notice the intimate way he addresses them. And notice this is, in a way, this is kind of a standard greeting that, that you see during the Roman times. The person addresses who he is, and then he addresses who he's talking to, which is what's going on here. As a matter of fact, here it says in the the MacArthur commentary, following first century custom, the salutation contains the name of the letter's author and its recipient. This is a very personal letter, and Philemon was one only of three individuals, Timothy, Titus, are the others, who receive a divinely inspired letter from Paul. I'm sure Paul wrote a lot of letters. As a matter of fact, we saw in the end of Colossians, as we were looking at his closing to the book of Colossians, which he just finished up, that he talked about forwarding this letter to um, Laodicea. And he also, in mentioning that, said that 
the church of Laodicea was going to return or send a letter that he wrote to them and forward it to the Colossians. He mentions it in that letter to the Colossians, but we don't have a book of Laodicea in the New Testament. We have a mention of a letter, but we don't have a book. And that's because not every letter Paul wrote ended up as part of the canon of Scripture. So there are a lot of letters that are lost to history, so to speak. But the ones that God wanted, that's another important thing about Scripture. The ones that God wanted somehow made it in, somehow became accepted, somehow became part of this canon. And this canon was actually um, a recognition of which ones were genuinely from God and which ones may have been written by an author who wrote other books that were part of the canon, but for some reason was not recognized as having authority. So we see that this is the case, that, that God managed to preserve and help us as believers recognize which books and which letters were part of the scripture and preserved it. Think of the time frame over which the books were all written. Job, which is one of the oldest. We're not even sure how old it is. But somehow it made it into Scripture. That's the working of a God. A God who is all-powerful and able to preserve what he wants preserved which is why it is so important to take Scripture seriously. Why it's so important for us to look at it and examine it and allow it to examine us. See, that's one of the amazing things about God's Word. As I spend time learning from the Scriptures, the Scriptures work on me to help me examine my own heart. And they work on me to work a change in my life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and all that you've done for us. We thank you for the love and the grace and the kindness that you have shown to us. We thank you for your word and what you have brought to us. We thank you that someday we will see much more clearly all of the history that, that you used to redeem us. And that we will have a much better understanding of your long suffering, of your grace, of your mercy. And we thank you so much that you chose to step into history to provide a means for us to be forgiven and to provide a means to change us and to come into us and make us new people. We pray that you'd help us to live up to the holy calling which you've called us. In Jesus' name, amen.